Hello, everyone, and welcome to Alpha Bets, a weekly conversation where we talk about interesting companies and the drivers contributing to their growth and success or demise and failure. I'm your host, Nathan Warden, and I'm here with Ross Klein, the CIO of Change Ridge Capital, and Pat Connolly, our resident stock detective. Today, we're looking at Planet Labs, a company that's been shooting satellites into the sky and is imaging the entire Earth every day. I'm super excited about this company, but I have a feeling Ross and Pat are going to bring me back down to Earth. Let's get started. Does Planet Labs have a first mover advantage? Maybe a bit, but nothing to like really get home about. I really think the best case study is look at the uh, Suez Canal when the Evergreen ship got stuck into it. When CNBC posted an article about it, they posted five images from five different satellite providers. So really like same image, five different people supplying it. It seems of people who can supply the images. I guess the uh, image library is a competitive advantage if you have year over year changes. But even then, there's companies who have been doing this longer than Planet Labs. They have some data set that's valuable, but nothing that I'm super wild about. Ross, how difficult is it to get approval to launch new satellites? It takes time. It, it takes legal battles with the SCC. You need to get through the U.S. government. There's international laws around it. But all signs are pointing to that being a fairly stable condition. If that were to get tougher, it would probably prove as a competitive advantage for Planet Labs. Ross, do you think Planet Labs has a first mover advantage? They definitely have some, right? I mean, the company says they've got 10 times more satellites than their nearest competitor. They're doing this for 10 years. They spent $700 million to build this business out. They've built something. It, debatable what that's worth, but they've certainly built something and they got to this industry earlier than most have. It's very expensive to send satellites into the sky. Is capital a barrier to entry? In the environment we're in, I don't think capital is almost ever a barrier to entry. In a different environment, higher 5%, 6%, whatever you want, capital becomes more scarce. Right now, access to capital is fairly ample. So I wouldn't consider that necessarily a key barrier to entry. And the cost to launch is going down drastically every single year. And this is something the company touts. It's why their gross margins go up so much, even though revenue is kind of growing at a, a slower clip. Pricing power. Does Plant Labs have pricing power? Is there concurrent user licensing or is it per seat? I would say if it was per seat, then you would see pricing power, but I don't think it is. I think it's one organization who gets it because really how many people are trying to access this data on a day-to-day -day basis. It might be like a special case scenario. There are some organizations obviously that probably use it on a day-to-day -day basis, but I don't think the TAM for everyone using it every day is as big as they want it to be or hope it to be. You thought some pricing power, Ross? Until there are more competitors, which right now it's not a fiercely competitive industry, they probably have some pricing power, but I'd be concerned because you're looking at a company that touted, you know, 110% dollar retention rate and in a recent quarter showed like 95. So that, that's not necessarily a sign that they're maintaining pricing, but that might just be a factor of the fact that this is actually a pretty seasonable business. Yeah. So what makes it seasonal? I think a lot is ag. 25% of the revenue comes from agriculture. So depending on the time of the year and when crops are being harvested, they might have a customer pay them more or less. They don't talk about the seasonality that much in their filings or in their conference call. So I'm not 100% sure on that answer, but ag would be my best guess. The CEO on their, their recent press tour and on podcast talked a lot about sales and marketing and how all they need to do is get more sales and marketing reps out there to sell the products. It's ready to go. It's, we just need more sales and marketing. How important is sales and marketing to the overall success of the company? I think it makes or breaks it. Yeah. I think there are a lot of competitors doing the same thing or similar things. So if you can have a killer sales and marketing team that can convert customers, then, then that's when it can work. But right now, I think they should spend more on sales and marketing because they're kind of the media darling. Ross, you have a contrary opinion there? I think sales and marketing matters when your sales and marketing team are rock stars. There are some business models that are built on having fantastic sales teams. You know, there are companies that license medical products. There is a pet laboratory company that was built on its sales and marketing team that's got a very generous valuation right now. It is hard to give them that credit until they've done that. And the revenue growth to date has been slower than you would have expected from a company that has this sort of IP, this sort of a compelling story, clear use case, you would think that they might be growing faster. We definitely want to talk about that compelling story. That's the whole reason why we found this company. Can you lay out the story of why is this, why is the story of Planet Labs exciting investors? Could you imagine being able to map the world on a minute by minute basis? 
all the time. It's amazing. From ag to finance to defense, the use cases are tremendous. It is a really exciting story. The management team, brilliant for putting it all together. You know, they've gotten the company this far. It's hard to discredit them. I'm not trying to. It's incredibly compelling. The TAM is huge. It's just a matter of deciding if there's something preventing competitors from coming in and if they're able to continue growing. You would think with a multi-trillion dollar addressable market, a company that's been spending money on increasing sales and marketing, that the growth rate would be higher than what it's been the last two years. Pat, why do you think the growth rate isn't higher than what it's been so far? Well, there are free alternatives. Like if you want slower updates in your data, I don't know if everyone really needs minute by minute or every 45 minute updates. Maybe drones can replace a lot of these images. Maybe it's more of a solution looking for a problem. That's a good point. Yeah, Russ. I think on the, the drone comment though, the the regulatory landscape doesn't allow for an American to have a drone over Russia and vice versa, for instance, right? So the low earth satellite complex does make a lot of sense. And, and they were incredibly clever to enter that space and, and use it in this sort of use case. So you know, I, I don't know that they're going to get competed away by a differing technology quite yet, but somebody else could launch more satellites. So when it comes to launching satellites, what is the cost to launch new satellites? Any intel on that? Some of them hope that they can get a satellite for a million dollars, some like $10 million, some max are, which is like the big, make a big satellites. It's like some of them are cost like $800 million per satellite. So it ranges, but these small sat satellites, like they fit in your arms, you can hold them, they're lightweight, but they only last like three, three, four years. You replace them. Any thoughts on is the replacement cycle of these satellites a burden or a bullish thing, Ross? It's a burden. <laughs> uh, I mean... A, a, a company that spends this much on CapEx and has to continue to spend it isn't going to get a multiple to sales. It's going to get a multiple to free cash flow. Pat, is this data a must have for end users? That remains to be seen. From the naked eye, like some of the images, like maybe not, but it could be kind of like LiDAR where AI and machine learning can see stuff that we can't see. And there's like certain filters. And so maybe it is in some sense, or maybe it will be, but I'm not really sure if it is for everyone. Ross, do you think that in the coming years, it could become must-have data? Yes, I think it will be. I think everyone's going to want to have this data from hedge funds to farmers, government entities to local jurisdictions, regulators. They're going to want this data. Will this data become a commodity because other companies will catch up and will be able to offer the same thing? That's the $10,000 question. If we can answer that question, now we'd know this is a screaming long or a dead short. I don't have a great answer for you there, but given that they're not the ones launching their own satellites, SpaceX is doing it, it does pose a potential risk, I think. And Pat, where do we see the current best product market fit for Planet Labs' data? I'll go back to it. I thought the Suez Canal thing was the best. Like those $9 billion worth of materials held up in this canal. You can zoom in on the crates, see who has their inventory stuck there, see what ships are stuck there. You can, there's a lot of economic implications there. I'm sure some people, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to them. Some people, it's probably the worst thing that ever happened to them. It's a mm -hmm. huge event. So valuation time. Right now, they're trading at a price to sales of 14X and EV to sales of 15X. Pat, what do you think of that valuation? I mean, it's a growth company, but it's not totally priced like a growth company. I guess it could grow into it easily. The sales and marketing team can kill it and get people on board. But yeah, right now they're not making money. The customer base isn't really growing. It's growing single digits quarter over quarter. Nothing too, like, too impressive. I can cross sell to their existing customers, but that's really not happening. So I'm not really sure. So Rob, It's priced like a growth company. 14 times sales is a growth company. It's, a, it's priced like a growth company, but not growing like a growth company. It's not growing fast enough. I feel like I'm missing something. They talk about it being a recurring revenue business, but if you go quarter by quarter, it's clearly seasonal. The growth rate decelerated meaningfully last year, and it hasn't bounced back much this year. You'd think that off of a COVID base, they'd be growing faster right now with a multi-trillion dollar addressable market and all the capital resources that they have to pour into sales and marketing. I don't understand it. So you're not convinced by the, the CEO saying, we're the only ones that have this type of data. Anyone else who wants to do this, well, it'll take them five years to make it. What do you not trust about that? That someone else can build up that database. In two years, what happened three years ago isn't that relevant. I want to see year over year data. That's important to me. But if we fast forward a couple of years and someone else starts sending satellites out into space right now and has $700 million to spare to, to, to build this out, in three years, I don't care which one I'm using. It might be a race to the bottom on pricing. One year from now, so December 2022, what prediction would you like to make about the story of the year for Planet Labs? 
I want to explore that relationship they have with Google. So Google could have built these satellites. Google Ventures, this is like a perfect fit. And Google is a customer. So that gives me some pause in being bearish about this because Google could have done it themselves. They chose to go with Planet Labs. So I think in the next year, you see some sort of development. Either Google becomes a bigger customer or a smaller customer. And that might be a leading indicator for the rest of the business. All right, so I'll push you on that. Which way do you lean? Do they become a bigger or smaller customer? They haven't built it yet. So I have to imagine they're probably going to be a bigger customer for them. All right. Ross thinks Google will be a bigger customer of Planet Labs in the next year. Pat, what's a prediction that you have for uh, Planet Labs? Um, I guess I kind of have to push back on the Google point a little bit. Like I always, because like, so Sky, Sky, Black Sky is backed by Palantir. Triangle Orbital is backed by Lockheed Martin. And Skylogic is backed by Tencent. You have these big backers for every SPAC that's come out, but it's probably like us putting like 10 basis point position in companies to track it. It's, it's really not that material, in my opinion. But a year out from now, I think they're the media darling. So I think their numbers will kind of not impress you. But I think they'll kind of get all the story headlines for all this hype. And of all the SPACs, they might do the best amongst like retail investors and like really enthusiastic people. Cool. And finally, I will just invite one last thing. Either of you want to say, I am buying, I am selling, I'm shorting. Any, any stance you want to take? Uh, I'm not going to touch it. It's like too like up in the air for me. I need stronger conviction to go in any direction. We'll leave it be then. Cool. Thanks so much for your thoughts on Planet Labs. This is a really fun one. I'll go on the record of saying I was very uh, interested in the narrative, just the story of it, the idea that Ross even talked about the everyday imaging. I mean, that got me interested. Like it, without looking into it further, I could easily see myself starting a, a starter position, buying in and then kind of waiting it out. And that's why I love having conversations with the two of you. <laughs> Thanks everyone for watching. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. Uh, we would love to keep chatting about this company and watch it go further the next year. Thanks a lot. See you next time.